tell me your backstory. So you were from Oregon originally, is that right? Yeah, well, I was born in Washington, but I mean, I'm totally Pacific Northwest. Right, and, and then Swedish I, extraction. Um, I think it's Norwegian, mostly Swiss. You know, I'm just at Heinz 57, <laughs> like a lot of Americans. I'm an immigrant. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, my mom owned a bar and restaurant, and my dad killed himself when I was 10. So we would just, oh. even when he was alive, I just hung out in the back of the bar and did little art projects, you know, like with all the stuff from the bar, the little mermaids and the umbrellas, and when they used to give you cool things and monkeys and bar napkins that had nasty quotes on them and, you know, seashells out of the garbage from people that ate steam clams and baked oysters. And I just always used stuff that was handy. And back in those days, they used to send material to people, you know, to make clothes and stuff. And yeah. so I would go to the post office and dig all the, that stuff out of the garbage. And then I used glue and staplers and just sat in the back until mom got up work like at three o'clock in the morning. Wow. And so I so, never had a bedtime or anything. This explains your sleeping habits. <laughs> yeah. Really, I never had a bedtime ever. I remember when my daughter was young and she was in kidney garden and I picked her up and the teacher said, you know, Tessa seems to be tired a lot. And I said, she goes, what time do you, does she go to bed? And I go, well, first we put her daddy to bed around nine and then we go to bed around 11 or so. And she's like, little kids need more sleep than that. I'm like, really? <laughs> I never knew that. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. So, so you never had a bedtime. You spent your evenings basically doing art spontaneously. And did you ever have any formal training at any point? Like, did you take art at school yeah. or what happened then? Yeah, I took art in school and high school. And I remember on the back of my piece, I won a little prize for is the bar, you know, the booze order, which she needed to pick up. So it's like, oh, here, my daughter won an award. Well, we need some vodka and some Crown Royal. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it wasn't like anything that was impressive to anybody else. And then I got Social Security and veterans because my father had died. So it was kind of like uh -huh. I could go to school and get $157 a month and then $63 from veterans. So I kind of had my, and I'd worked my whole life. I mean, since I was four, five, I was five because that's when my mom bought the sea hag. So I washed dishes to begin with, you know, and just kind of moved on from there and was a full-time waitress by 10. And so I just always made money, you know, as so I never thought of anything except for just I'd be a waitress my whole life and I do art my whole life. I never really thought of anything else. And then I taught a lot of kids art. But if I taught kids art, I never came home and made art where whenever I worked in a bar or a restaurant, whenever I came home, I always made art. Because uh, it was an outlet. That's right. Oftentimes, if you do something for a job, it's not such a it's not an outlet anymore. No, <laughs> it's definitely a job. Yeah. So. so you so when you finished school, were you still waitressing? Yes, I'd waitressed until I had a couple brain tumors. So I waitressed until I was 49. Wow. Wait, so you've had a whole bunch of stuff happen. OK, so that's a whole other conversation. So you waitress till you're 49. You're doing your artwork. And then when uh -huh. did you start? But I mean, teaching? I was always doing my I was teaching like when my kids were young. So my daughter's 36. So I've taught for like 40 years. Oh, okay. So that was all ongoing. Wow. But How I mean, did you was, have... I didn't teach full time. I was called an artist in residence, which um, where I live, that meant like you go in and teach for a week and you teach right. 125 kids a day. So, and then I was kind of like the good fairy. I had my little roller thing and I had all my art supplies on it. And I would go from room to room because you just teach every room in the whole school. So huh. it was pretty crazy. It was exhausting. Yeah. And I always took it home with me. You know, the next day it's like, oh, I want to get little Jennifer. I want to show her this artist. You know, so you're always thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow. Which waitressing, and especially once you start working in a bar, just performance art. And because what do you mean? I was, 
Well, I was a little princess because my mom owned it so I could have summers off. There were all the notes around the bar, you know, nobody can take off these days. <laughs> and I got to take off summers. I got to take off when I did my master's, September and May, which is when it's the busiest time for the place. But mm-hmm. I could do whatever I wanted because <laughs> my mom owned the place. So, And instead of ever cutting people off that were drunk, I just became the bad waitress and just never went to their table. <laughs> So it was easy, and then my mom sold it, and I worked for the lady for about a couple of weeks and thought, well, this isn't any fun. I mean, I can't have Christmases off and all the time I want off. So, <laughs> And at that time, I'd had a brain tumor, so I had it when I was 49. Huh. And was that – did you recover from that fully then? Did you just have it removed and, and life went back to normal, or has it had any kind of long-term impact? Well, life kind of went back to normal, but not really. It's like I had Alzheimer's, but knew it. So it was like I had just learned Final Cut Pro, and I was doing video work. And because it was the last thing I learned, it was the first thing I couldn't figure out. And I couldn't figure out, like, how to take my clothes off, you know, my sweatshirt. So I just had a pair of scissors, and I just cut down the middle of a sweatshirt. And I came out of that by going to a laughter workshop like a week long laughter coach workshop in LA. And it was right around this time. It was May 10th is when I went down there and it was a two week certificate. So I'm a certified laughter coach. And that I just grew up in a, in a laughing, you know, hardcore make fun of people life. That was just how we dealt with everything. Cause my mom always said, you know, nobody wants to come to the bar and hear your sad story. They want to laugh and have a good time. So it's like we weren't allowed to be depressed or sad or, you know, not make people feel good. So, so the laughter workshop was what helped you recover from the brain tumor injuries. Yes, but then I had another one. So they said that it'd probably come back in five or six years and it came back in seven years. So my last one was in 2013. And that one wasn't cognitive, it was physical. So it's, I was ready for it to be cognitive. So I got rid of all my clothes that I couldn't get on and off. And, you know, I made sure to like be prepared for it because I wasn't prepared for the first time at all. And then the second time, cognitively, I was 100% the same, but physically, and I still have trouble walking. And oh, gosh, that's so frustrating. Like that. Is yeah, is that but because I'm not it, in a wheelchair and I'm happy? <laughs> well, that's good. But I'm 100 percent young. <laughs> is is that because it affects that particular area of the brain that deals with that function? Correct. Right. And then I had radiation, but that was it was really good because I had proton radiation. So it's the kind okay. that just affects that one spot, and it's really really expensive. But I was considered poverty plus. So it's one of those things that it's good to be broke sometimes. Because <laughs> I always said, if I wouldn't have been broke, I would be dead. You know, that's kind of my second choice because insurance didn't want to pay the hundreds of thousands of dollars it cost. Wow. So anyway. Did that did that affect your art in any way? Like what you produced or how you produced it or the output? Yes, it did. Quite a bit. And it was during, I was doing a World War II project from my master's, which is where I met Carol Ann. And, and my, since my dad died, and I had a huge portfolio of letters he wrote his mother that I had found shortly, actually before my brain tumor. And I did a whole art project on that, but it was sort of semi erotic because he was super good at what he did. You know, he was a super good fighter pilot. He was in Iwo Jima. And so he flew back on the planes with those little Corsair, which the wings go up like this. And so um, he was really a smart man. And I didn't know how smart he was because he was abusive and I didn't like him, (laughs) you know, because he had PTSD. But in those days, they just gave you a gazillion drugs, whatever you wanted. So I didn't like him until after I got all these letters. And I read all these letters he wrote his mother, and he was like a genius. I mean, he was so smart. And I think that's what really messed him up, because he said, if I ever get out of this place alive, I will have lost all hope in humanity. And this really, and he would say things like, you know, we're over here dying, and 
we get like two sentences in the newspaper about the Korean War. So it's in World War II and the Korean War. And so I had been doing interviews with veterans. Like I did over a hundred veteran interviews, you know, down to like prisoner of war and Hitler youth and women air service pilots and Rosie the Riveter and just kind of everything. I did code talkers, Tuskegee men. So I did that. And it's what I started doing because then I, and I've always been a little obsessed with death. So I started asking them, you know, what do you, where do you think we go from here? Like when we die, because I became, you know, I was close to death. So but then it makes you hyper aware. <laughs> and one of my favorite movies was Harold and Maude. I just always liked that. Which so. movie? Harold and Maude, it's called. What's that it's about? It's a really old movie now. It's about a young kid that always fantasizes about death. So he's always trying to hang himself, you know, and people come in, his parents come in the room like, okay, Harold, you know, come on down. It's dinner time. And then he meets this old woman that's kind of the same, only she's like older, like in her 80s or 79. And they fall in love because they always meet each other at they, their pastime. They go to funerals. So anyway, it's kind of, it's an interesting movie. Yeah. And then when I got out of the out of rehab, then I watched the whole Six Feet Under series that was on like Netflix or something. And it was great. But when I was younger for pastime, I used to, um, there were lots of dead cats be- behind my mom's restaurant because there was a cat lady that had like a hundred cats. I mean, it's like, you know, just feral cats everywhere. And so if the cats would die, my girlfriend and I would get cigar boxes from the bar. And then we get that material and we decorate it. You know, we decorate our coffins and we put the little cats in there and then we'd spray raid on them. So bugs wouldn't get them supposedly. And we had a whole little service for them and we built crosses and we had a whole little kitty graveyard. <laughs> and so that was, you know, just another kind of art project that you do when you're raised by parents that work all the time. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of traffic in those days. So you didn't have to worry about your kids getting run over. Yeah. If there were perverts out there, they were all in the bar. <laughs> so they were kind of like, <laughs> oh, outside and play, it's safer. <laughs> so so with the, the veterans project then, so you interviewed all the veterans and then and then what was the, the whole output from that? So where did that kind of go in terms of the I art made sequence? One to three minute short videos and I did them like collages. And I did it all on at home. So I would interview people via Skype mostly. And they all said that they really appreciated it because they had never told their story because they would never tell it to family because then they'd have to see their family. And they didn't know me. And because I grew up in a bar, it's just always been easy for me to talk to people and to get to people to talk to me. Mm-hmm. And so they all would thank me afterwards because it was the first time they got to tell their story. So I got lots of pretty intense, gruesome stories. And then they'd invite me to come move in with them. <laughs> it was kind of cute. My daughter and, so and I took it. What did you do with the output then? Did that get, like, it, did you still have that? Is that displayed yeah, somewhere? I still did have you... it all, but I also made experimental videos with it. So I'd put cartoons with it, and not really the guy's, it was the guy's voice and it was speaking but then I do all these artsy fartsy layered things and then I got into film festivals but once you get into film festivals basically all that happens is you get to watch all the films for free that are in the festival and you get to go to little workshops and but you don't make any money on it you know it's not like so it's kind of like okay I've done these all these experimental videos and I got in a lot of video festivals so that that was nice film festival yeah. And my partner's a tech guy. So we always just said every good artist needs an, a nerd. That's our phrase. So he's a great nerd. But I did all the. I learned how to do all the tech stuff. You know, I, I went to the college in Portland, Northwest Film Center, because I was getting my master's in Provincetown. And the way that it worked, because it was low residency, was then once you came back to your home, wherever your home was, there are only a couple of us from out of state. Then you find who you want to be your your like at home teacher, and so I just did all video, which I hadn't done before. 
And, and there, is that video still available somewhere? Like, is there anywhere that anyone could watch it? Yeah, on Vimeo. And I'm, I just got a new website. And so I can put some on there too. My website just has a bunch of my artwork. I kind of wanted to do it like my biography for my grandkids. Oh, you know, yeah. so it's not as much about buy this art. And most of my art, because I used to just paint nudes and dancers in the woods. And like my first war series I did were dancers. I gave them guns and they were, you know, there was no ammunition in them. I said, okay, you're sub I kind of became like a film director. I said, okay, you have to seduce the enemy because his guns don't have any, any bullets in them or anything. So you have to seduce them. And I, luckily I had these two models that were just fabulous. And they'd kind of do anything for me. And now they both live in New York and had become famous, you know. So that was pretty fun to have all these. There's three of them. I had three models from my small town that were just great. They were all dancers. Oh, wow. So That's amazing. The Oregon Coast is full of Coast, artists. Full of artists. I would say coastal towns, like breed artists. You know, all the artists go to the coastal towns. So they're very democratic and very liberal minded. And, you know, we all work together. Yeah. Yeah. Why is that, though? What is it about coastal areas? Is it because of the lighting, the scenery? Like, why do you think that artists are kind of drawn to that? I think a lot of times you live on the coast and you're like before global warming, truly, the Oregon coast was really bad weather. You know, the weather would be sideways and pouring rain and. It just becomes a, a way of life. You know, they become tourist towns so you can make a living easily. And you can, and also artists like jobs that, you know, you don't have to think about too much because you can go to work and then you can still do your artwork. So it's not like a job where you're an engineer or a technician and you have to think about what you're doing. And so I just, and even if you weren't an artist while you were there, you know, there's a lot of downtime when you live in those kind of places. So what do you do in your downtime? A lot of writers. There's a lot, a lot of writers, which makes sense. They get to look out the window. You know, you can afford oceanfront, which you never could if you lived in California or yeah. somewhere else. Wow. How did you get into Bitcoin then? Because I think I feel like this is a story that's probably quite interesting because you're now, just for context, you're sort of, Oh, is it fair to say you're focusing on Bitcoin art or you're doing a lot of Bitcoin related art? I'm doing Bitcoin and also EcoPlay is another series that I'm working on simultaneously. So it gets kind of, and the eco stuff I'm putting figures in because I've always painted figures. So it's kind of complicated because I'm going a lot of different directions. But Bitcoin, I just had this two year show because after. <laughs> I really wanted to quit doing my World War II stuff, but all these guys were getting up to their hundreds. So it's like, well, do I have to wait till the last one dies? <laughs> How can I get out of this project that I had just been so invested in? For six years, I did it. And then I took all the video and I sent them to an organization called Witness to War. So this all documented. And then I just made the little experimental videos with them. So I did the art stuff with them. And then I did a project, which is like this thing behind me that uh -huh. is called Connecting US 20. And that was after my mom died. My mom was like a bigger than life person. She was the little, the big fish in the little pond. So she played the alcohol bottles and people came from all over to hear her. So she was kind of a performance artist, you know, so she liked you to go in the bar and wear your short skirts and hug everybody, smash your boobies up on them, you know, before you got in trouble for doing that stuff. And yeah, so we were just raised around people and kind of entertaining people. And a lot of movie stars went there, like, because Ken Kesey was from there. So he did sometimes a great notion and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And there's been lots of movies made on the coast. Amazing. But how does that segue then into Bitcoin? So you handed off your, your veterans project and then what happened? Well, then my mom died. So I did a two year project called Connecting US 20. Because when I was going to school in Provincetown, I realized that Boston is the beginning of highway, US Highway 20. And I lived in Newport, that's just on Highway 20. That's the end of it. So 
I was doing this project before the sign even went up. I knew I wanted to do something on Highway 20. And I didn't know what it was going to be. And I just started putting safety pins together. So safety pins became a big part of it. And I did that because my mom was had Alzheimer's. So I'd just sit on the phone and we wouldn't talk because she got to a point where she couldn't talk very well. Right. And I'd just be putting safety pins together. But I didn't know why. I thought it's kind of like the rosary or Buddhist beads, you know. The, I'd say, okay, mom, I'm still on the phone and I'm doing my thing. So it's okay if we don't talk. But I didn't know what I was doing them for. And then one thing morphed into another thing. And then they were starting to underfund libraries. So I knew I wanted to do the project in libraries. And I made two maps of every state. And that's this purple one over here, one of the maps. And then I did two two maps of the whole Highway 20, which is 13 states that it goes to. And so I did an event in libraries in each one of those states. And then I had a big show at the end. It's kind of, you know, if you're, like I said, the the big big fish in the small pond. So I've had lots of one-woman shows, you know, which I love because then it's just you have the whole, I make it into an installation. And so I had this Highway highway 20 show that was showed all these maps and they were hanging from the ceiling. And then I had made all these uh, 16 by 20 photos of the books that we did in each place that I had them cover these tubs. And so that was the whole back wall because I, I had them made into 16 by 20 photographs at Costco and then laminated them and had those all put up there. And then I did a, a performance part when people would come in. I called it running through rainbows. So they'd toss up this cheesecloth and run through it. And I would do little videos on my iPhone, you know, the hyper, the fast ones. And then, no, the slow ones. Slow Some motion, ones. yeah. Yeah, so the, the cheesecloth was really floating down. And then I would, um, so that was my project. And with the night of the opening, so when it, the first, you know, so I'd been done, I just finished a two-year project that was pretty intense. And my girlfriend that I had met in New Zealand, that's another big story, she came and then we went out to dinner afterwards and I asked her what her son was doing. And she said, I don't really know. He's into some kind of money on the Internet. I don't know what it is, but that's just all he does. And it was at a time because my mom had just died. So she had given me some inheritance and I never had a bunch of money. I didn't know what to do with money. You know, when I grew up, everybody bought houses. If you had money, that's what you did. You bought houses or land. And at this time, I knew Carol Ann from school. And she had come into a little bit of money, too. So we, she, when I told her I wanted to buy a house, she was like, no, no, don't buy a house because then it's not liquid. You know, then you can't just sell it if you want some money. So we started doing stocks together on E-Trade. And I started with my pot stocks and my hemp stocks because I was afraid, you know, to invest any money. And then we started doing bank stocks. And we did a lot of D&D, you know, our due diligence. So I learned a lot by that. And by E-Trade was so good. That was the little old lady that called those men in the middle. And I, I was just like, I want to do this for life. And you can't do that with Bitcoin because nobody answers the phone when it comes to Bitcoin. And so then I started researching. I started researching the shit coins. So my first coins I bought were Litecoin and Ethereum. And then I bought a bunch of stupid ones, you know, like a bunch of other people at that time. And then Carol Ann and I had a residency together, an art residency. And I went there and I at, at the time I had a bunch of money in Facebook and Amazon. And we did pretty good on Facebook and Amazon. But I, yeah. And it was more fun to read about than banks and, you know, hemp and pot that wasn't going anywhere. I was expecting it to go up, but it didn't. And so I said to her, well, I'm taking all my money out of Facebook and I'm going to put it all into this crypto currency. And she's like, no, no, Sally, at least keep Facebook. You know, you have to keep some of it. You can't just put it all in. And I said, <laughs> no, I just feel that this is the next thing. You know, mm -hmm. and I'll, when somebody told me about it, all my little hairs on my arm stand up and it's just like, this is it. This is what I need to do. And whenever I want to know about something, I always do art about it. And that's how I learn about it, because then I like to research that kind of stuff. Oh, so that's interesting. Had, well, so you use that like a processing mechanism? Yes, definitely. So like oh. right now I'm doing eco-based because I'm moving up to my daughter's 40 acres. 
So I really want to understand like the, the trees and the mushrooms and all the thing that's going on with the mushrooms. And I already have it set up where when I die, I'll, I'll be buried in a mycelium coffin and be buried on her property. And then the grandkids and future generations can go sit down on top of where the mushrooms are growing underneath their feet and get some wisdom from Mima. <laughs> So I really am studying that a lot right now, you know, the different things that they're making out of mycelium mushrooms and they're even making like this leather thing. So I'm trying to get like some of the leather and the information. And I really want to do, I have two shows on Earth Day. The next like 2025 will be my first one. And then the following year. And I'm doing that with another woman who I'm real excited because she likes to write and I Mm. hate to write <laughs> so she'll do all the writing for us and I'll just get it I like to talk so I kind of help get the shows and she does the writing that you have to do because you have to submit stuff right so that's when I started with bitcoin well, well you started actually, with the shit coin so how did you get back to bitcoin yeah. the way <laughs> we got to bitcoin well, though, was, why did you start with the shit coins why why not bitcoin what was it about the shit coins that caught your attention they were a lot cheaper uh, you know, okay. And I, at the time, because I'd been doing stocks, and I remember laying in the, this bed at a friend's house one night, and people, it was when Bitcoin was, or when all the crypto was going way up in 2017. And so I was just, we did this, like, I don't even remember what it's called now, but it's like stock tweets where you read other people, you know, it's kind of like a Facebook for stocks. And they were talking about 24 seven, because I was like, well, it's past five o'clock, you know, isn't it closed? What are you guys talking about? And then they were talking about it being global. And I've always loved to travel and I've loved being in different countries, you know, so the different time zones. So I just always put it on my weather app, you know, what time is it in or what's the weather in London? And you can see the time underneath it. So I have London on there since that's the time they go by. And (laughs) I just like really, you know, start it being interested and also I'm really interested in women you know women's strength and I'm a wannabe lesbian (laughs) (laughs) people who bought my art a lot of times told me that so I really like the idea of women having power you know (laughs) that it's not all about the men's power that women have power and so I did when I first started doing shit coins I also started doing a whole series on women in tech so and back throughout Mm -hmm. history and did a lot of that. And also the reason why I started that part was because they were talking about, I think it was Bitcoin, the first Bitcoin conference. They had a lot of the meetups and stuff in like strip joints. And it, they were bit, hardly any women were in Bitcoin at the beginning yeah. or any of this. Then, so I talked Carol Ann to doing this conference with me. We just went to it and I think it was 2017 and it was in Dallas, Texas. And it was all like the Alex, I can't remember his last name, but the one from Celsius, you know, and I remember him oh, saying. Oh, uh, Mashinsky, ma- ma- yeah. Yeah, the one from Celsius that died first. It was the first, the first exchange that went down. And I remember he said, how many <laughs> I thought, people I thought believe- you meant Alex died, and I was like, I was sure he was on Twitter the other day, and then I'm like, he's dead. <laughs> no, he's alive. Stock Twits. That's what I was thinking of the name. It was called Stock Twits. Anyway, so he was, he had everybody raise their hand, you know, who's going to win basically Ethereum or Bitcoin. And at the time I had Ethereum and I had Litecoin because I thought Litecoin was like Bitcoin. But then the more, because we just did all our D&D, we read everything. Carol Ann reads absolutely everything. And then she sends me the good stuff. So I'm really blessed with that. And I'm a strong believer that if you're going to get into Bitcoin, you need to really research it. And yeah. now there is so much to research with all the podcasts. In 2017, I mean, you could read absolutely everything about it and still not know that much because there weren't any podcasts. Yeah. Andreas, Entra, opposite, Entra. Andreas Antonopoulos, yeah. Yeah, he was pretty much the only thing you could find on the computer. So we studied him a lot. And we used to love to listen to the podcast by Laura Chin. And she was really good, but she was all shit coins. So, you know, we, we heard all the interviews with shit coins and mining and that type of stuff. And we both liked her. But then once we got into Bitcoin, and so that's where I had gotten a lot of the women names and the women that I painted were from that 
And so ah. they're not they're not valid anymore because they're not into Bitcoin. And I only do Bitcoin. I would never do anything else again, just Bitcoin. So when did you come to that position? It was actually, it was right during the crash with Roger Veer and trying to say Bitcoin Cash was Bitcoin. And then there was Bitcoin. And we had started buying Bitcoin, Carol Ann and I both. We kind of did things simultaneously. But then during the crash, it was definitely obvious that Bitcoin Bitcoin was the real the real money and all the other ones were scams. I mean, it was just really obvious if you did your D and D. But yeah. I think if you're gonna do it, it's really good to do it with like your co part not co partner, but I mean to have a buddy, you know, kind yeah, of Yeah, like have an investment buddy. Swim with a buddy. Yeah, so you can both work on it together and bounce things off of each other. And hmm. so we both just started doing Bitcoin and we almost bought Bitcoin cash because it's like, okay, well, which one's going to go? Maybe we should do 50 50, you know, put half into Bitcoin cash. And luckily we didn't. So. And so did your Bitcoin art evolve because of your investing interest in Bitcoin and that sort of need that you have to understand things through creating yes. art? Yes, hmm. totally. And the Bitcoin piece that is on, on the little video that they're showing the artist for this Bitcoin conference is a piece that I had started with the shit coins. And so I had bought a lot of commencement coins and I had a bunch from like Ethereum and Litecoin and Ripple. And I had all those in the piece that is actually in the Bitcoin conference because then I had to dig them all out. <laughs> so I actually tried to dig them out and that didn't work. So I cut them out so that I could put my Bitcoin ones in. So that piece of, I worked on for five years because it started out as a shit coin piece. And then <laughs> That's it funny. morphed into a big coin. <laughs> yeah, someday, so someday Bitcoin some, uh, I was going to say someday some uh, art uh, restorer or something is going to crawl over your work and be like, this was not the original piece. It was amended at some point. <laughs> yeah, like I gave my daughter my one, the Pacific Ring of Fire. And I told her that, Long after I'm dead, you know, when they start doing that DNA testing or the testing where they can really see what's underneath, because that painting started out as all the women in Bitcoin, and then it went from that to trees and things, and then it went from the eco work, and it became the Pacific Ring of Fire. So it has like three or four different series underneath it, and I've always kind of done that, you know, rework stuff. Yeah, I'm just scrolling I'm through looking at that one. Oh, okay, the Pacific Ring of Fire. Yep, yep, I see it. Wow. Huh. So how did you, okay, so how did you end up uh, then becoming an exhibitor at the Bitcoin conference? For Just for context for people, we're recording this before Bitcoin Miami 2023. So you're going to be mm -hmm. one of the artists exhibiting at Bitcoin Miami 2023. Um, can you talk about the journey to to doing that yeah. and how, how you met the team and what, what that display, what that... Um, you know, show is going to look like? I think it was on Facebook and I started following this gallery that was called um, Crypto with a K, Crypto Gallery. And it was in Linwood. That is that what you call it? Linwood, that part in, in Miami that's real famous for the art. And uh. so I got in that gallery and I had a show in there and then Carol Ann contacted them. And so she was part of it too. And then that's when Bitcoin crashed. And so they went out of business, but because we were in there, then they had our name. So the first Bitcoin conference in 2020, it was supposed to be in 2020, but because of COVID, it ended up being in 2021. And that one was a lot smaller and the artists were invited. Pretty much all the artists that were in that gallery were invited to show at the Bitcoin conference. And we just did it all ourselves. You know, we had our space and we put our artwork up and we didn't have to be juried in or anything. And we just hmm. did the transactions. And, and will so you be the... selling your pieces there as well? Like are they for sale, the pieces that are at the conference? Yes, everything's for sale, but it goes through Scar City, Scare City, I think it's called. And so it's an auction. Uh, and last okay. year, they, so it's been in the, in the conference center, it's just been there two years. And I didn't go last year because I had to have another surgery. So I didn't get to go. But this year I'll go and we're just going to pretty much hang out in the gallery because I can't walk around much. So 
Carol Ann said that the speak the speakers are quite a ways away. And she did the booth last year and said that was really kind of funky because if you hung out at the gallery, that's where all the, and she knows everybody. So that'll be fun because she literally listens to podcasts all day long. So, and I don't listen <laughs> while to she it. paints. Yes. And I like to listen to books on tape. So I don't, I listen to the ones she sends me and we listen to everything Natalie anything that Natalie does. Like I always watch every video. Natalie Brunel's, you mean Natalie Brunel's Hard Money Show? Yes, I love her. Just anything about her, you know, like I've read about her history. Her and um, the strike guy, Jack Mallers. Oh yeah, Mallers. Jack Mallers, yeah. I love you should, you should paint just, Natalie. I wonder if she'd sit for you. I don't need her to sit for me. I, and I I plan to do one of her. Oh, you definitely. do? Uh-huh. That's a great yeah, idea. Yeah, because she's woman power all the way. I mean, she is just so amazing. And she's so gorgeous. I mean, I just watch her because she's so gorgeous. <laughs> That's why it started. And it's like, wow, and she's so smart and so articulate and has such a good memory, you know. Yeah, so I definitely love Natalie. And Jack yeah, Miller, she's... just because he's, I have kids, and he's like such adorable. I mean, I just want to pinch his cheek. And we just make fun of him in his empty closet, <laughs> you know, this like big fancy house with the empty closet. It's like, okay, are you just like yeah, someone's you letting know that you that's hang a, out? That's a Zoom background. Like you, anybody oh, can have. Is? Yeah. And I just I think it's so that. funny. Yeah. If you go on to Zoom and you look at the available backgrounds, I think it's like one of the ones that you can pick from their template selection. But it's so funny to me because I'm like, of all the templates that he could pick, I don't <laughs> understand why he's got this empty closet. I don't know if it's kind I of think you go in there and it's like your mind is clear because there's nothing to like pay attention to. You know, it's not like, oh, what kind of clothes does he wear? You know, I mean, I, I feel- didn't realize that, but it's the Zoom background. That's hysterical. Yeah, so I think, I mean, there's probably a painting you can do around that, something. There's probably some deeper meaning to his empty closet that you could relay in a piece of art. <laughs> yeah. Or Put just little him in his empty closet. And all the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Oh, that's really cool. That would actually be really fun, though, a series of, like, prominent Bitcoiners who are kind of hit that, well, I think, who will become historical figures, you know, the Jack uh-huh. Mallers, the Nat Brunels of the world at some point are going to be historical figures. You know, when we look back on the history of this sort of Bitcoin revolution happening, whatever you want to call it, I just feel that, you know, there are certain characters that will be written about in the history of Bitcoin. Yeah. And I have some text from um, Michael Saylor, of course. So I have one of a lifeboat and then I have one of the rockets, but I think neither of them are done. So I have so many paintings that are started, but not done. And I go to art residencies all the time. So I just went to three different ones, one in um, Maine and one in upstate New York. And I just got back from one in South Carolina. So I don't necessarily finish all the pieces that I do there because where I live now, I don't have a studio. So I do oh. the the larger part and then I, I have a six foot table. So I can do the smaller part on the six foot table. So I have a couple wow. more Bitcoin ones started that are like, you know, 36 by 36. So not big, but not small. Yeah. How many pieces are you showing in Miami? Three. And it was a jury show this time. And I think that was the limit was three. It's a what show? It's, it's a jury show. So oh. you had to submit your images and they chose if you could be in or not. Which so. are you able to, are you allowed to share which pieces are going to be in? Well, you're allowed to jury, you know, you send them the pieces that you want juried in and you could send up to three pieces. And then like Carolyn and I both got our three pieces in. So, but oh, no, I'll sorry. What I what I meant is, are you allowed to share which pieces? Because you sent me some photos of some of your pieces. So there's the orange, kind of, and yellow cloth. Yeah, and with the... that one's not going to be in actually. That one was in okay. the first art residency. I mean, the first show that was in Miami, and actually, it's still in the box and it's in a storage room. It, room, so I haven't even took it out of the box. Because so Carol Ann said, "Oh, is that one going to be in?" I go, "No, it's still in a box." <laughs> Because it came in the box and I just, you know, had the other things going on and I'm 
building a tiny house on my daughter's 40 acres. So I have a, I, I have a storage unit up there where all that stuff is. All my Bitcoin paintings are up there, except for these new ones. So I had just done these three. Well, that's amazing. Well, so you can live in a tiny house. I love it. <laughs> actually, it's going to be more an a art studio with it. Uh, with a couch in it but I'll see and I don't like to cook so <laughs> I'm just going to have one hot plate and a microwave and and I do love my ice I'm an ice addict so I'm having a full refrigerator so I can have a full freezer for my ice and I'll have big sinks because I you know need that I use a lot of cheesecloth and silk so I'll need that to soak right. my stuff in and rub oh. paper off and and then I'm going to have a wheelchair accessible shower so that if I if down the road I need one I don't I'm not in one now I can get by with a cane but you know you want to be prepared because I mean once I move up there it's my forever home I won't have to pay electricity or water or taxes or anything yeah oh don't that's amazing that. <laughs> yeah and then I, because I've always had dogs until 2008 and so I'm obsessed by a dog and I'm going to get a dog and I'm going to get it service trained. So I'm not going to go to any residencies this next year and a half until my gold, golden doodle gets service trained. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, we've yeah. got two and it dogs. Just turns yeah. out I've been looking for a, a golden doodle for a long time. It just turns out that the lady that breeds this one is like 10 minutes from my daughter's house. So we become friends and I've met the mother and the father and the nieces and all the cousins to my dog that's not even impregnated yet. <laughs> it was meant to be, clearly. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And then my daughter has dogs, so and she has cats and the cats can't come in the house because her husband's allergic. So I'll have cats and dogs and since it's a wheelchair shower, we can just put them in there and you know, wash them off because she has a lake there and and being in Oregon, it gets pretty muddy. <laughs> it's like, bring the dog in. So my floor is not going to be carpeted or anything. So bring yeah. the dogs in, let them bring in the mud. And yeah, I'm excited about it a lot. That sounds great. Can you talk to me a little bit then about how you feel Bitcoin relates to your environmental work and your environmental views? Because I'm sure you have quite strong opinions about Bitcoin mining. Could you talk a little bit about that and where you see it fitting in? Yes. I have a big issue about mining and I have a big issue about Democrat Republic. And I, I wrote you that when I said I wasn't going to talk about it. <laughs> and it's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. I always talk about things I say I'm not going to. Like, definitely don't say what you're not going to do because then I definitely do it. But the main thing for me, being from the Northwest, is the water. You know, so they're like, oh, well, working with dams, that's great because it doesn't use any extra. But it's what it does is it heats up the water. So then the warmer water's in the, the river system and that kills the wildlife and the fish and then the fish can't spawn as well. So when you're talking about that, you're talking about using hydro, is that right? Right. And that's the one in Wenatchee, which is where I was born. That's where they started doing big ones, you know. And so then I have all my relatives. If When I talk about Bitcoin, that's the first thing that comes up is this dam that they basically destroyed the habitat in it by doing the electro the hydro electricity and then nuclear too the town that I'm moving to at my daughter's is really close to where the biggest nuclear plant was on the northwest and my partner is really involved in Japan and he's like on a couple Japan society and he's been to Japan 49 times you know in nuclear plants the problem is the waste they have nowhere to put the waste from it. And so it pollutes everything too. And then it also heats up the water system and it just kills every every wildlife and plant life around it. So those are the two that bother me a lot, of course. And what would and your the, preferred way of, I mean, so if you're obviously a fan of Bitcoin, so I guess you've gone through the whole process of this. In your mind, what's your preferred way then of Bitcoin mining? Like what would be your preferred energy source if you could pick one? geothermal that's why i did that 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 pacific ring of fire and all, i didn't realize that there were so many volcanoes you know and that the el salvador is really working on like the volcano city and so there's just once they can figure out how to do geothermal and my thing is that i tell people is it's still new 
And the people that are involved in Bitcoin, there are so many young, smart, engineer, technician kind of people. So I believe that they will figure it out. It's just not might not be in my lifetime, but I believe it will be in my kids' lifetime. And so with geothermal, I don't know how much you've delved into this, but how would somebody do that? Would they just harness the the heat that comes from the volcanoes and then use that to power right. the miner? Is that the thinking? Yes. And would then that... I don't understand all the flaring and all that mess. mess. <laughs> and Carol Ann sends me all those articles because she knows that I'm very much against that part, to the part that it's hard for me to really orange, orange pill people. Because when they ask me that stuff, I'm not really a debater, especially on stuff I don't understand. Like I understand the waterways because I understand the nature eco part of of the world. Yeah, that makes and sense. I'm I mean, I'm not by that part. I'm not a climate expert, but my understanding is that methane is 80 times more warming than GHG. I think if I'm getting this right, yeah, and it's like 80 said, times more warming than me. carbon. Yeah, and that when you drill for oil, boring. which <laughs> right, but but you know, effective, right? Because if you drill for oil, um, methane gets expelled, and I think usually what they do is they burn it off, and that's very polluting, right. or it's very it's very warming. I don't know how polluting it is in terms of the air that you breathe, but it's very warming. Um, uh -huh. And so what they the thinking behind it is, or the science, if you like, that if you if you capture that and just use that energy to power the Bitcoin miner, it doesn't go into the atmosphere. So it, it's it's more effective at reducing global warming is the logic or 80 times more effective than, for example, right. uh, not burning coal. So that's the rationale behind it. And then in addition to that, it's quite hard to capture those methane flares because they're often in very remote locations. So to get somebody who wants an energy source, like you're not going to have a city next to that location that says, hey, we need to use that, that energy. But the Bitcoin miners can just take the miners there and they're very mobile. So that's my understanding of why that's helpful. Yeah, because obviously, yeah, we can't shift off of an oil based economy overnight. I mean, our entire we'd all be living in sort of tents and, you know, hunting off the land. And that just wouldn't be feasible, I guess, in this day and age at this point. But what it would do, the theory at least goes from environmentalists, what they seem to think is that that would be a very effective way of, of mitigating global warming. Yeah. And then now in Ireland, they're using all the cow dung to make yes. enough electricity too that one i thought was fun it's like okay i'll read that one <laughs> but it's just like i'm not interested in oil you know and and like i said carol ann sends me every article about the positive part of that and i'm just like i just can't buy it you know i mean it just it's because i don't want to study it i don't want to do any D, D on it because it bores me it bores me and i just really don't care i mean i care because of the climate component but I don't care enough to be interested to read about it. Yeah. Well, that's you know, fair. Like when I invested in banks, <laughs> I didn't want to read about banks. So it's like social media was fun to read about, you know, so to go from banks to Facebook was a lot more fun. Yeah. So tell me, I'm just conscious of time, but can you just wrap up maybe and tell me what your next projects on the horizon will be then? So you're doing the exhibition in Miami and then do you have any particular projects that are Bitcoin related that you're working on? Um, yeah, I am. I'm working on, I really like, there's this one that I did for the conference that AI, they put it in AI, like if Dr. Seuss was to write about Bitcoin, what would he write? So I have that in there and I just think it's hysterical. And so I'm playing a little bit with AI and partly because I'm a bad writer. So I think maybe this will help me, but it didn't because I'm bad at prompts. So my prompt, I didn't do this Dr. Seuss one. I found that on, on Twitter, you know, Twitter's just full of stuff that you can appropriate and it's okay to appropriate stuff. So the next one, there's two that I want to work on. One I am working on and it's a, a 36 by 36. It's a, actually bigger than that, but I'm going to put it on a canvas. Because I work on silk. So I paint actually on silk with heavy acrylic. Because oh. since I travel all the time, and since I don't really live anywhere full time, you know, to, to, to store that, to store painting takes up room. Where you can store like 100 silk pieces, you know, and it doesn't take up as much room as 10 canvas pieces. So I paint on silk and then it doesn't cost hardly anything to ship it back and forth. Or I roll it up and just have it in my suitcase. 
Whereas you can't do that with Canvas. Like just sending my three pieces to the conference in Miami cost me $290 to ship three pieces. Where when I did my art residency and I did, I don't know, 10 pieces or 20 pieces, I rolled it up and put it in my suitcase. And some I sent home and it cost me $10.13. And that was through the post office. But I mean, that's the difference, you know. Yeah. Wow, you have that's to incredible. take all that into an account. And so do you dabble in digital art? I mean, what do you think about this sort of generative art using AI? And do you dabble in that a lot? Like I know you're saying about the prompts, but is that stuff that you're going to start using and incorporating into your art? I think so, but not NFTs. I've gone back and forth with NFTs and I've done a lot of due diligence on them. And it just, to me, if I did NFTs, I would want to use little pieces of my video because videos for NFTs. And actually I looked at like this gallery in Canada once. I can't remember what it is and I didn't bookmark it, but it was super cool. And if I was younger, I'd probably do that, but I'm going to be 66 next week. And so I don't want to learn a whole new thing. You know, I just, it's just because there's a lot of learning to do. So I don't want to do NFTs for that reason. And I was going to do them to begin with. But the more I read have about you, them, the more. I was going to say, have you looked into ordinals? I don't know what they are. I've ah. seen the word. <laughs> um, it's, I guess you would describe it as NFTs on the Bitcoin blockchain in very simplistic terms. It's been a bit controversial because I think a lot of Bitcoiners didn't like the idea of, well, I'm probably going to explain this wrong now, but essentially it's inscriptions on the Bitcoin blockchain. But the idea is that you have ordinal numbers that are linked to those specific UTXOs and that can allow you to transfer ownership because you can sell that specific UTXO in a transaction, allegedly, in the order that it's happened. There's, There's debates about whether this is actually valid or not and whether it makes sense. But the big kind of thing was, oh, this is now NFTs on the blockchain, on the Bitcoin blockchain, and therefore you don't need to use a token um, uh, in order to... And so are these then your actual paintings? Well, you can put the actual painting on the blockchain anyway because you can put an inscription in there. So you can put images and, gosh, I'm I'm really over my skis here on the technicalities of it, but my understanding (laughs) is that (laughs) this is probably going to get absolutely hammered by anyone that watches this that actually understands this stuff in detail. But my understanding is that you can kind of wrap it in this sort of envelope where that, that image is then contained. So you could do that anyway, but the idea with the ordinals is that you can say, well, that transaction happened with this particular UTXO. And therefore, whoever owns that UTXO has digital ownership of that particular inscription. That's my understanding how of you, how it works. How do you spell that so I can look it up? Ordinal. Uh, just like, no, ordinal, like ordinal numbers. So O R D I N A L. And I wonder if that's bit, off the Bitcoin. Like, I know the NFT started off. A building on top of Ethereum, mostly. Yeah, so ordinals are basically the UTXOs on the Bitcoin blockchain. That's um, what I had thought. Yeah. I think that Dennis said something to me about it. Dennis, who organizes the art shows now at oh, the okay. Bitcoin conference. <laughs> I don't know who so. Dennis is, but I'm sure I shall meet him at the conference. <laughs> yeah, and you're going to stop by and see us. A hundred percent. Yes, a hundred percent. I will be there. I will stop by. I will take a selfie. I'll come and see your art. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, a hundred percent. excited about that. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm really honored to be in it. And I love doing, I'm doing a painting. And like I said, I can't pronounce anybody and I can't even blame it on my brain because I couldn't do it before. But the woman from Afghanistan, K A Y A. M-O-O, it looks like boob at the end, but I don't know how to pronounce it. But she had trained a bunch of young girls in tech, and then they worked for her doing tech. And she had been paying them in Bitcoin for like 10 years. And so then when they had the uprising in 2021, and the women left, they could, they could um, go to another country, and they had their Bitcoin to start their life. You know, because they didn't have the money taken away from them like every other female. That's yeah, that's the, right. I remember country. reading that story. That was quite an amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. So really I started incredible. a painting on that. I'm not done with it. But that one, 
So the, the three that I have started now is that one and then a couple from Bitcoin Magazine, the one about what Bitcoin is, and it explains it really simple. So to me, it's simpler than the white paper. And then I have all these plastic things that I had created that I'm going to put the Bitcoin magazines in. And so I want to do a series where every Bitcoin magazine then is in a painting but they can slide it in and out the magazine so that it becomes like a collector's item. And so I've had like 18 of those made, but that's another thing. (laughs) I mean, there's always another thing. Oh, it's incredible. Really ever caught up. We're dead. (laughs) How many artists uh, are exhibiting? Do you know at the conference? I think there's only 35 or something. And last year was like a (laughs) hundred or Well, last year it was like 100 or something, and I could have those numbers totally wrong. Carol Ann told me she, if you were talking to her, she remembers every number. and (laughs) You know, she can say everybody's name and tell you who does what podcast. And yeah, so it'll be fun sitting with her because she'll be like, oh, hi, Matt. Hi, Pete. Peter, you know, so I mean, I like listening to them, but I don't remember anybody's name. And a lot of it, like I'm not interested in the mining so a lot of those younger men, you know, they're out. My son's 33 now, and he's an Edward Jones. So it's been fun because it's given me a verbal connection to him. And I started collecting. I started sending my grandsons $50 for their birthdays and Christmas in Bitcoin. And I said to my son, I go, they can cash this out when they're 16. And maybe they're going to buy a nice bike or a crummy bike or a crummy car, or a nice car. Or they'll just be able to say they had this whack shit grandma that believed in this weird money that never went anywhere, you know, but it's, so it's a win-win. And I keep doing that. My daughter's an ecotherapist and she's not interested in technology, anything. So I'm just like, well, I'll just, you know, save it and we'll travel with what money I make off of it. But my son's right. kids actually, you know, I'm collecting for them on their, they have their own cold kite. So they're, they're offline too. Oh, that's, oh, fantastic. that's the other thing. They'll be that's billionaires the one day. <laughs> yeah. And Carol Ann saved me from losing all of my Bitcoin. She kept telling me because I had it on BlockFi and she kept saying, you have to take it off, Sally. And I was like, I just loved BlockFi. It was just like a bank, you know, it was like a bank for block for Bitcoin. So it was so easy and I got interest. I made like $1,500 interest and You know, you could call them up and get somebody on the phone. And it's what I wanted to do was be able then to to use my Bitcoin as collateral to build my tiny house without selling any of my Bitcoin because I don't want to sell any. But I have to because you need money, (laughs) that little money thing that you need to have money. But so that's the reason why I started was so that I'd be able to borrow from myself. And she kept going, Sally, it's going to all go away. And it did. It all went away. So I got it off just in time. Oh, you did. You managed to shift it. Oof, that was close. But it's and it's scary. It's hard, you know, because it takes a little bit of time from it to move over from one thing to your cold kite. So it's like, oh no, did I lose it? And then there for a while, it didn't show up. I did something wrong on trying to get it off BlockFi and put it on my cold kite, and I couldn't do it. And then I was afraid to start again, you know, to start a new wallet. So we used my partner's computer instead. And that's how it, it ended up coming over. But Cash App came right over. I love Cash App. Cash App is my favorite. It's just huh. so easy and it's easy to transfer the money. And it's just, I just love Cash App. It's oh, the only thing I'll use from now on. Right. Wow. And I tr- trust Jack Dorsey. And yeah, so I think he's great. I think Cash App's great. And Jack Dorsey has a name I can pronounce. So that's always good too. That's a good benchmark. Well, thank you so much, Carol. This has been, sorry, I called you Carol there. <laughs> That's okay. I don't care. I had Carol I'm in Sal. my brain. I know. <laughs> well, because I've been talking, I'm talking for her since she didn't want to talk. So I'm like, we're we're a team. I know. I feel like you might actually be the same person. She's just not telling yeah. me that. 
Yeah, I'm Thank really Carolyn so Tanner. I'm just pretending like I'm South Drum. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But thank you so much, Sal. This has been so interesting. It's really interesting to hear your journey as an artist and how you got into Bitcoin and the way you look at it and everything else. Um, could you just let people know where they can find you? So what your website is and your social media handles. Okay, my website is southstromart.com. And then my my handles are all like that Sal underscore Strom. But if you just put Sal Strom in there, it'll come up. And my picture's on there. And I got the laser eyes. So it's but I don't go to Twitter as much. Carol Ann does the Twitter. And I actually do the one that people can't stand the most, which is Facebook. And I do that just because they're all my friends down at the coast. So it's my friend one, you know. And then I do Instagram. And I'm hoping to post more. It's just it's such a hassle. I really mm. hate social media to post things on it. But it's like, especially now that all the galleries have closed down. And so people are selling their art on Instagram more than yeah. they are in galleries now. Yeah. And I noticed you you have a Instagram account. So I was looking at that right before we talked. Because I want to get a list of the women's names. So if there's somewhere I can, you know, you could direct me to a list of even, I don't know, how you're finding names or... Do you mean women that are in Bitcoin specifically? Yes, that are only oh. in Bitcoin. That then yeah. I can start adding to painting. Oh, that would be so cool. Like a yeah, women in I, Bitcoin. Yeah, like art I said, series. I really like the the women in Bitcoin. Are they going to be nude or closed? <laughs> I have them closed now, closed now. But they might be just clothed in a little swimsuits with designs or something. Thank you so much again. I can't wait to meet you in person and I'll I'll see your art. Yeah, thank you, Krista.